I had never intended to speak or write again of the Charrier House once I had fled Providence on that shocking night of discovery. There are memories which every man would seek to suppress, to disbelieve, to wipe out of existence, but I am forced to set down now the narrative of my brief acquaintance with the house on Benefit Street, and my precipitate flight therefrom, lest some innocent person be subjected to indignity by the police in an effort to explain the horrible discovery the police have made at last. That same ghastly horror it was my lot to look upon before any other human eye. And what I saw was surely far more terrible than what remained to be seen after all these years, the house having reverted to the city, as I had known it would. While it is true that an antiquarian might be expected to know considerably less about some ancient avenues of human research than about old houses, it is surely conceivable that one who is steeped in the processes of research among the habitations of the human race might occasionally encounter a more abstruse mystery than the date of an L, or the source of a gambrel roof, and find it possible to come to certain conclusions about it no matter how incredible, how horrible or frightening, or even, yes, damnable. In those quarters where antiquarians gather, the name of Elijah Atwood is not entirely unknown. Modesty forbids me to say more, but it is surely permissible to point out that anyone sufficiently interested to look up references will find more than a few paragraphs about me in those directories devoted to information for the antiquary. I came to Providence, Rhode Island in 1930, intending to make only a brief visit and then go on to New Orleans. But I saw the Charrier House on Benefit Street and was drawn to it as only an antiquarian would be drawn to any unusual house isolated in a New England street of a period not its own, a house clearly of some age, and with an indefinable aura that both attracted and repelled. What was said about the Charrier house that it was haunted was no more than what was said about many an old abandoned dwelling in the old world as well as in the new. And even, if I can depend on the solemn articles in the Journal of American Folklore, about the primitive dwellings of American Indians, Australian bush people, the Polynesians, and many others. Of ghosts I do not wish to write. Suffice it to say that there have been within the circle of my experience certain manifestations which have lent themselves to no scientific explanation, though I am rational enough to believe that there is such explanation to be found, once man chances upon the proper interpretation through the correct scientific approach. In that sense, surely the Charrier house was not haunted. No specter passed among its rooms rattling its chain, no voice moaned at midnight, no sepulchral figure appeared at the witching hour to warn of approaching doom. But that there was an aura about the house, one of evil, of terror, of hideous eldritch things, none could deny. And had I been born a less insensitive clod, I have no doubt that the house would have driven me forth raving out of mind. Its aura was less tangible than others I have known, but it suggested that the house concealed unspeakable secrets, long hidden from human perception. Above all else, it conveyed an overpowering sense of age of centuries, not alone of its own being, but far, far in the past when the world was young, which was curious indeed. For the house, however old, was less than three centuries of age. I saw it first as an antiquarian, delighted to discover set in a row of staid New England houses a house which was manifestly of a 17th century Quebec style and thus so different from its neighbors as to attract immediately the eye of any passer-by. I had made many visits to Quebec as well as to other old cities of the North American continent, but on this first visit to Providence I had not come primarily in search of ancient dwellings, but to call upon a fellow antiquarian of note, and it was on my way to his home on Barn Street that I passed the Charrier house, observed that it was not tenanted, and resolved to lease it for my own. Even so, I might not have done so had it not been for the curious reluctance of my friend to speak of the house and indeed his seeming unwillingness that I go near the place. Perhaps I do him an injustice in retrospect, for he, poor fellow, was even then on his deathbed, though neither of us knew it. So it was at his bedside I sat and not in his study, and it was there that I asked about the house, describing it unmistakably, for of course I did not then know its name or anything about it. A man named Charrier had owned it, a French surgeon who had come down from Quebec, but who had built it Gamwell did not know. It was Charrier he had known. A tall, rough-skinned man, I saw little of him, but no one saw more. He had retired from practice, said Gamwell. He had lived there and presumably older members of his family, though Gamwell could not say as to this for as long as Gamwell had known the house. 
Dr. Charrier had lived a reclusive life and had died, according to notice duly published in the Providence Journal in 1927, three years ago. Indeed, the date of Dr. Charrier's death was the only date that Gamwell could give me. All else was shrouded in vagueness. The house had not been rented more than once. There had been a brief occupation by a professional man and his family, but they had left it after a month, complaining of its dampness and the smells of the old house. Since then it had stood empty, but it could not be torn down, for Dr. Charrier had left in his will a considerable sum of money to keep the property off the tax delinquent list for a long enough time. Some said twenty years to guarantee that the house would be standing there if and when heirs of the surgeon appeared to lay claim to it, the doctor having written vaguely of a nephew in French Indochina on military service. All attempts to find the nephew had proved futile, and now the house was being permitted to stand until the period specified in the will of Dr. Charrier had expired. I think of leasing it, I told Gamwell. Ill though he was, my fellow antiquarian raised himself up on one elbow in protest. A passing whim, Atwood, let it pass. I have heard disquieting things of the house. What things? I asked him bluntly. But of these things he would not speak. He only shook his head feebly and closed his eyes. I hope to examine it tomorrow, I went on. It offers nothing you could not find in Quebec, believe me, said Gamwell. But as I have set forth, his curious opposition served only to augment my desire to examine the house at close range. I did not mean to spend a lifetime there, but only to lease it for a half year or so, and make it a base of operations. While I went about the countryside around the city as well as the lanes and byways of Providence in search of the antiquities of that region, Gamwell did surrender at last the name of the firm of lawyers in whose hands the Charrier will had been placed, and when I made application to them and overcame their own lack of enthusiasm, I became master of the old Charrier house for a period of not more than six months, and less if I so chose. I took possession of the house at once, though I was somewhat nonplussed to discover that, while running water had been put in, electricity had not. I found among the furnishings of the house, these had been left in each room, exactly as at the death of Dr. Charrier, a half-dozen lamps of various shapes and ages, some of them apparently dating back a century or more with which to light my way. I had expected to find the house cobwebbed and dusty, but I was surprised to learn that this was not the case though I had not understood that the lawyers, the firm of Baker and Greenbaugh, had undertaken to care for the house during the half-century it was to stand, short of someone's appearing to lay claim to it as the sole survivor of Dr. Charrier and his line. The house was all I had hoped for. It was heavily timbered, and in some of the rooms paper had begun to peel from the plaster, while in others the plaster itself had never been covered with paper and shone yellow with age on the wall. Its rooms were irregular, appearing to be either quite large or very small. It was of two stories, but the upper floor had not been much used. The lower or ground floor, however, abounded in evidence of its one-time occupant, the surgeon, for one room of it had manifestly served him as a laboratory of some kind, and an adjoining room as a study, for both had the look of having been but recently abandoned in the midst of some inquiry or research, quite as if the occupation of the house by its brief tenant post-mortem charrier had not touched upon these rooms. And perhaps it had not, for the house was large enough to permit of habitation without disturbing them, both laboratory and study being at the back of the house, opening out upon a garden now much overgrown with shrubs and trees, a garden of some size since the house occupied a frontage of over three lots in width and in depth reached to a high stone wall which was but a lot removed from the street in its rear. Dr. Charrier had evidently been in the midst of some work when his hour had struck, and I confess its nature intrigued me at once, for it was plainly no ordinary one. The inquiry was not alone a study of man, for there were strange, almost cabalistic drawings resembling physiological charts of various kinds of saurians, though the most prominent among them were of the order Loricata and the genera Crocodilus and Osteolemus, though there were also recognizable drawings of Gavialis, Tomistoma, Gaiman, and Alligator, with a lesser number being speculative sketches of earlier members of this reptilian order reaching back to the Jurassic period. Yet even this fascinating glimpse of the surgeon's odd vein of inquiry would not have stimulated any really genuine delving into his affairs, had it not been for the antiquarian mystery of the house.
The Charrière house impressed me at once as having been the product of its age, save for the later introduction of waterworks. I had all along assumed that Dr. Charrière himself had built it. Gamwell had nowhere in our somewhat elliptical conversation given me to understand otherwise. Nor had he, for that matter, mentioned the surgeon's age at his death. Presuming it to be a well-rounded eighty years, then it was certainly not he who had built the house, for internal evidence spoke clearly of its origin in the vicinity of the year 1700, or over two centuries before Dr. Charrier's death. It seemed to me, therefore, that the house only bore the name of its most recent long-time tenant, and not that of its builder. It was the pursuit of this problem which brought me to several disturbing facts which bore no relationship seemingly to credible facts. For one thing, the year of Dr. Charrier's birth was nowhere in evidence. I sought out his grave, it was, strangely, on his own property. He had obtained permission to be buried in his garden, not far from a gracious old well which stood roofed over with bucket and all still as it had stood doubtless, for almost as long as the house had been standing with a view to examining his headstone for the date of his birth, but, to my disappointment and chagrin, his stone bore only his name, Jean-Francois Charrier, his calling, surgeon, his places of residence or professional occupation, Bayonne, Paris, Pondicherry, Quebec, Providence in the year of his death, 1927, no more. This was enough only to further me on my quest, and forthwith I started to make inquiry by letter of acquaintances in various places where research might be done. Within a fortnight the results of my inquiries were at hand. But far from being in any way satisfied, I was more perplexed than ever. I had made my first inquiry of a correspondent in Bayonne, presuming that since this was first mentioned on the stone, Charrier might have been born in that vicinity. I had next inquired in Paris, then of a friend in London, who might have access to information in British archives pertaining to India, and then in Quebec. What did I glean from all this correspondence but a riddling sequence of dates? A Jean-Francois Charrier had indeed been born in Bayonne, but in the year 1636. The name was not unknown in Paris either, for a seventeen-year-old lad of that name had studied under the royalist exile Richard Wiseman in 1653 and for three years thereafter. At Pondicherry and later too on the Caramondal coast of India, one Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier, surgeon in the French army, had been on duty from 1674 onward. And in Quebec, the earliest record of Dr. Charrier was in 1691. He had practiced in that city for six years and had then left the city for an unknown destination. I was left patently with but one conclusion, that the said Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier, born in Bayonne, 1636, last known to have been in Quebec the very year of the erection of the Charrier House on Benefit Street, was a forebear of the same name as the late surgeon who had last occupied the house. But if so, there was an absolute lacuna between that time in 1697 and the lifetime of the last occupant of the house, for there was nowhere any account of the family of that earlier Jean-Francois Charrier. If there had been a Madame Charrier, if there had been children, as assuredly there must have been for the line to continue to the present century, there was no record of them. It was not impossible that the elderly gentleman who had come down from Quebec might have been of single status upon his arrival in Providence and might have married thereafter. He would then have been sixty-one years of age, yet a search of the appropriate registry failed to reveal any record of such a marriage, and I was left more bewildered than ever, though, as an antiquarian, I was fully aware of the difficulties of discovering facts, and I was not at that time too discouraged to continue my inquiries. I took a new line and approached the firm of Baker and Greenbaugh for information about the late Dr. Charrier. Here an even more curious rebuff awaited me, for when I inquired about the appearance of the French surgeon, both the lawyers were forced to admit that they had never laid eyes on him. All their instructions had come by letter together with checks of generous figures. They had acted for Dr. Charrier approximately six years before his death and thereafter. Before that time, they had not been retained by Dr. Charrier. I inquired then about his nephew, since the existence of a nephew implied at least that there had at one time been a sister or brother to Charrier. But here too I was rebuffed. Gamwell had misinformed me, for Charrier had not specifically identified him as a nephew, but only as the sole male survivor of my line. This survivor had only been presumed to have been a nephew, and all search for him had come to naught.
though there was that in Dr. Charrier's will which implied that the said sole male survivor would not need to be sought, but would make application to the firm of Baker and Greenbaw either in person or by letter in such terms as to be unmistakable. Mystery there was, certainly. The lawyers did not deny it, but it was understood also that they had been well rewarded for their trust, too well to permit of any betrayal of it save in such casual terms as they had related to me. After all, as one of the lawyers sensibly pointed out, only three years had elapsed since the death of Dr. Charrier, and there was still ample time for the survivor to present himself. Failing in this line of inquiry, I again called on my old friend Gamwell, who was still abed and now noticeably weaker. His attending physician, whom I encountered on the way out, now for the first time intimated that old Gamwell might not rise again and cautioned me not to excite him or to tire him with too many questions. Nevertheless, I was determined to ferret out what I could about Charrier, though I was not entirely prepared for the keen scrutiny to which I was subjected by Gamwell, quite as if he had expected that less than three weeks' residence in the Charrier house should have altered my very appearance. After the amenities had been exchanged, I turned to the subject about which I had come, explaining that I had found the house so interesting I desired to know more of its late tenant. Gamwell had mentioned seeing him. But that was years ago, said Gamwell. He's been dead three years. Let me see, 1,907, I think. I was astounded. But that was twenty years before he died, I protested. Nevertheless, Gamwell insisted, that was the year. And how had he looked? I pressed the question upon him. Disappointingly, senility and illness had encroached upon the old man's once fine mind. Take a newt, grow him a little, teach him to walk on his hind legs, and dress him in elegant clothes, Gamwell said. I give you Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier, except that his skin was rough, almost horny, a cold man. He lived in another world. How old was he, I asked then, eighty? Eighty? He was contemplative. When first I saw him I was but twenty, then he looked no older. And twenty years ago, my good Atwood, he had not changed a jot. He seemed eighty the first time. Was it the perspective of my youth, perhaps? He seemed eighty in 1907 and died twenty years later. A hundred, then. It might well have been, but Gamwell, too, was dissatisfying. Once again, there was nothing definite, nothing concrete, no single fact, only an impression, a memory of someone I felt Gamwell had disliked for no reason he could name. Perhaps some professional jealousy he did not care to name biased his judgment. I next sought the neighbors, but I found them for the most part younger people who had little memory of Dr. Charrier, except as someone whom they wished elsewhere, for he had an abominable traffic in lizards and the like, and none knew what diabolic experiments he performed in his laboratory. Only one among them was of advanced age. This was an old woman, a Mrs. Hepzibah Cobbett, who lived in a little two-story house directly behind the Charrier garden wall, and I found her much enfeebled, in a wheelchair guarded over by her daughter, a hawk-nosed woman whose cold blue eyes looked at me askance from behind her pince Yet the old woman spoke, starting to life at mention of Dr. Charrier's name, realizing that I lived in the house. You'll not live there long, mark my words, it's a devil's house, she said with some spirit that degenerated rapidly into a senile cackling. Many's the time I've laid eyes on him, a tall man bent like a sickle with a wee tuft of beard like a goat's whisker on his chin. And what was it that crawled about at his feet I could not see? A long black thing, too big for a snake, though it was snakes I thought of every time I set eyes on Dr. Charrier. And what was it screamed that night? And what barked at the well? A fox indeed, I know a fox and a dog too, like the yawping of a seal. I've seen things, I tell ye, but nobody'll believe a poor old woman with one foot in her grave, and ye ye won't either, for none does. What was I to make of this? Perhaps the daughter was right when she said, as she showed me out, you must overlook mother's ramblings. She has an arteriosclerotic condition which occasionally makes her sound quite weak-minded. But I did not think old Mrs. Cobbett weak-minded, for her eyes snapped and sparkled when she talked, quite as if she were enjoying a secret joke of proportion so vast that its very outlines escaped her keeper, the grim daughter who hovered ever near. Disappointment seemed to await me at every turn. All avenues of information yielded little more together than anyone had yielded. Newspaper files, library records. All that was to be found was the date of the erection of the house, 
1697 and the date of the death of Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier. If any other Charrier had died in the city's history, there was no mention of him. It was inconceivable that death had stricken all the other members of the Charrier family, predeceasing the late tenant of the house on Benefit Street, away from Providence. And yet it must have been so, for there was no other feasible explanation. Yet there was one additional fact, a likeness of Dr. Charrier which I discovered in the house. Though no name was appended to it where it hung in a remote and almost inaccessible corner of an upstairs room, the initials JFC identified it beyond reasonable doubt. It was the likeness of a thin-faced ascetic, wearing a straggly goatee. His face was distinguished by high cheekbones, sunken cheeks, and dark blazing eyes. His aspect was gaunt and sepulchral. Thus, in the absence of other avenues of information, I was driven once again to the papers and books left in Dr. Charrier's study and laboratory. Hitherto, I had been much away from the house in the pursuit of my inquiry into Dr. Charrier's background. But now I was as much confined to the house as I had previously been away from it. Perhaps it was because of this confinement that I began to grow more keenly aware of the aura of the house, both in a psychic and a physical sense. That unhappy professional man and his family who had remained here but a month and then left because of the smells abounding had perhaps conditioned me to smell the house. And now, for the first time, I did indeed become sharply cognizant of various aromas and musks, some of them typical of old houses, but others completely alien to me. The dominant one, however, was identifiable. It was a musk I had encountered several times before in zoos, swamps along stagnant pools, almost a miasma which suggested most strongly the presence of reptiles. It was not impossible that reptiles had found their way through the city to the haven of the garden behind the Charrier house. But it was incredible that they should have persisted in such numbers as to taint the very air of the place. Yet, seek as I might, I could find no source of this reptilian musk inside or out, though I fancied once that it emanated from the well, which was doubtless a result of an illusory conviction. This musk persisted, and it was especially strong whenever rain fell or a fog formed or dew lay on the grass, as might have been expected, moisture heightening all odors. The house was moist too. Its short-lived tenantry had been explained in part by this, and in this certainly the renter had not been in error. I found it often unpleasant, but not disturbing, not half so disturbing as other aspects of the house. Indeed, it was as if my invasion of the study and laboratory had stirred the old house to protest, for certain hallucinations began to occur with annoying regularity. There was, for one, the curious barking sound which seemed to emanate from the garden late at night, and for another, the illusion that an oddly bent reptilian figure haunted the darkness of the garden outside the study windows. These and other illusions persisted, and I, in turn, persisted in looking upon them as hallucinatory, until that fateful night when, after hearing a distinct sound as of someone bathing in the garden, I woke from my sleep convinced that I was not alone in the house, and putting on my dressing robe and slippers, I lit a lamp and hurried to the study. What I saw there must certainly have been inspired by the nature of my inquiry into the late Dr. Charrier's papers, that it was a figment of a nightmare I could not doubt at the moment, though I caught but a faint glimpse of the invader. For there was an invader in the study, and he made off with certain papers belonging to the Charrier estate. But as I saw him in the brief glimpse I had of him in the wan yellow light of the lamp held overhead and partially blinding me, he seemed to glisten, he shone blackly, and he seemed to be wearing a skin-tight suit of some rough black material. I saw him for only an instant before he leapt through the open window into the darkness of the garden. I would have followed then had it not been for the disquieting things I saw in the light of the lamp. Where the invader had stood there were the irregular marks of feet of wet feet and more, of feet which were oddly broad, the toes of which were so long nailed as to leave the marks of those nails before each toe. And where he had bent above the papers there was the same wetness, and over all there hung the powerful reptilian musk I had begun to accept as an integral part of the house, so powerful indeed that I almost reeled and fainted. But my interest in the papers transcended fear or curiosity. At that time, the only rational explanation which occurred to me was that one of the neighbors, who had some animus against the Charrier house and were constantly agitating to have it torn down, 
must have come from swimming to invade the study. Far-fetched, yes, certainly. But could any other explanation readily account for what I saw? I am inclined to think not. As for the papers, certain of them were undeniably gone. Fortunately, these were the very ones I had finished with. I had put them into a neat pile, though many were not consecutive. I could not imagine why anyone would have wanted to take them, unless someone other than myself were interested in Dr. Charrier, perhaps with a view to laying claim to the house and property, for these papers were painstaking notes about the longevity of crocodiles and alligators, as well as of related reptiles. It had already begun to be plainly evident to me that the late doctor had been studying reptilian longevity with almost obsessive devotion, and with a view clearly to learning how man might lengthen his own life. If the secrets of reptilian longevity had been revealed to Dr. Charrier, there was nothing in his papers thus far to show that it had, though I had come upon two or three disquieting suggestions of operations performed on whom was not set down, with a view to increasing the lifespan of the subject. True, there was one variant vein of notes in what I assumed to be Dr. Charrier's handwriting, treated as a related subject, but to me, one at variance from the more or less scientific inquiry into the long life of reptiles. This was a sequence of cryptic references to certain mythological creatures, particularly one named Cthulhu and another named Dagon, who were evidently deities of the sea in some ancient mythology completely unknown to me, and suggestions of long-lived creatures or people who serve these ancient gods named the Deep Ones, evidently amphibious creatures living in the depths of the seas. Among these notes were photographs of a singularly hideous monolithic statue of a distinctly Saurian cast of feature labeled E. Coast Hivaoa is Marquesas, object of worship, and of a totem pole of the Northwest Coast Indians of a disturbingly similar workmanship, also reptilian in aspect, this one being marked Kwakiutl Indian Totem, Quatsino Sound, Simti erected by Tlingitins. These curious notes existed as if to show that Dr. Charrier was not averse to examining rites of ancient sorceries and primitive religious beliefs in an effort to bring about some earnestly desired goal. What that goal might be was soon evident enough. Dr. Charrier had not been interested in the study of longevity for its sake alone. No, he had also wished to prolong his own life. And there were certain upsetting hints in the writings he had left behind him to suggest that in part at least, he had succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. This was a disturbing discovery to make because it recalled again the curious history of that first Jean-Francois Charrier, also a surgeon, about whose later years and death there was fully as much mystery as there was about the birth and early years of the late Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier, who died in Providence in 1927. The events of that night, though not frightening me too badly, did result in my purchasing a powerful Luger pistol in a second-hand shop, as well as a new flashlight. The lamp had impeded me in the night, which a flashlight would not do in similar circumstances. If indeed I had a visitor from among the neighbors, I could be sure that the papers he had taken would no more than whet his appetite and sooner or later he would return. Against that contingency I meant to be fully prepared, and if again I caught a marauder in the study of the house I had leased, I would not hesitate to shoot if my demand to stop where he was were not heeded. I hoped, however, that I would not have occasion to use the weapon in such a manner. On the next night I resumed my study of Dr. Charrier's books and papers. The books had surely at one time belonged to his forebears, for many of them dated back through the centuries. Among them was a book translated into the French from the English of R. Wiseman, testifying to some connection between the doctor Jean-Francois Charrier, who had studied in Paris under Wiseman, and that other surgeon of similar name who had until recently lived in Providence, Rhode Island. They were en masse a singular hodgepodge of books. They seemed to be in every known language, from French to Arabic. Indeed, I could not hope to translate a majority of the titles, though I could read French and had some smattering of the other Romance languages. I had at that time no understanding of the meaning of such a title as Unausprechlichen Kulten by von Junst, though I suspected that it was akin to the Count Derlet's Kult des Gules, since it stood next to that book on the shelf. But then, books on zoological subjects stood beside weighty tomes about ancient cultures. They bore such titles as An Inquiry into the Relationship of the Peoples of Polynesia, 
and the Indian cultures of the South American continent, with special reference to Peru, the Pinacotic Manuscripts De Furtivis Literarum Notis by Giambattista Porta, Thicknesses is Cryptographic, The Demonolatreia of Remigius, Banfort's The Saurian Age, A File of the Aylesbury, Massachusetts Transcript, Another of the Arkham, Massachusetts Gazette and the like. Some of these books were certainly of immense value, for many of them dated as far back as from 1670 to 1820, and though all showed much wear from use, all were still in relatively good condition. These books, however, meant comparatively little to me. In retrospect, I am constrained to believe that, had I examined them more attentively, I might have learned even more than I did. But there is a saying that too much knowledge of matters men are better off without knowing is even more damning than too little. I soon gave over my examination of the books because I discovered, pressed in among them on the shelves, what seemed at first glance to be a diary or journal, but was on closer examination manifestly a notebook, for the entries dated too far back to have encompassed Dr. Charrier's span of years. All were written in a crabbed, tiny script, which was most certainly the late surgeon's, and despite the age of the first pages, all had been written by the same hand, suggesting that Dr. Charrier had set down these notes in a kind of rough chronology, very probably from some earlier draft. Nor were they jottings alone. Some were illustrated with crude drawings which were nevertheless effective, as are on many occasions the primitive paintings of untutored artists. Thus, upon the very first page of the handbound manuscript, I came upon this entry. 1851, Arkham, Asif Goad, D.O., and with it a drawing, presumably of the said Asif Goad, emphasizing certain aspects of his features which were Batrachian in essence, for they were distinguished by an abnormally wide mouth with peculiar leathery lips, a very low brow, strangely webbed eyes, and a generally squat physiognomy giving them a distinctly and unmistakably frog-like appearance. This drawing took up the majority of the page, and the jotting accompanying it I assumed to be a notation of an encounter. Evidently in research, for it could hardly have been in the flesh with a subhuman type. Could the do have been a reference to the deep ones, mention of which I had previously encountered? Which, doubtless, Dr. Charrier looked upon as a verification of the trend of his research, a trend to support a belief he probably held that some kinship with Batrachia, and hence very probably also Saurians, could be traced. To that end, too, there were other jottings. Most of them were so vague, perhaps purposely so, as to seem to me at that first examination of them virtually meaningless. What was I to make of a page like this, for instance? 1857. St. Augustine, Henry Bishop, skin very scaly, but not ichthyic. Said to be 107 years old, no deteriorative process, all senses still keen, ancestry uncertain, but Polynesian trade in background. 1861. Charleston, Baylotch family, crusted hands, double jaw construction, entire family manifesting similar stigmata. Anton, 117 years old. Anna, 109, unhappy away from water. 1863, Innsmouth, Marsh, Waite, Elliott, Gilman families. Captain Obed Marsh, a trader in Polynesia, married to a Polynesian woman. All bearing facial characteristics similar to Asef Goads. Much secretive living. Women seldom seen in streets, but at night much swimming, entire families, all the rest of the town, keeping to their houses, swimming out to Devil Reef. Relationship to do, very marked. Considerable traffic between Innsmouth and Ponop, some dark religious worship. 1871, Jed Price, carnival entertainer, billed as alligator man. Appears in pool of alligators, sorry in look, long lantern jaw, said to have pointed teeth, but whether real or filed, unable to determine. This was the general tenor of the jottings in the book. Their range was continental. There were notes referring to Canada and Mexico as well as the eastern seaboard of North America. From them, Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier began to emerge as a man obsessed with a strange compulsion to establish proof of the longevity of certain human beings seemingly bearing some kinship to Saurian or Batrachian ancestors. Admittedly, the weight of the evidence gathered could one have accepted it all as fact, rather than as wishfully colored accounts of people with some marked physical defect, seemed to lend to Dr. Charrier and his belief a strange and provocative corroboration. Yet the surgeon had not often gone beyond the realm of pure conjecture, 
What he sought seemed to be the connecting link among the various instances which had come to his notice. He had sought this link in three bodies of lore. The most familiar of these was the Vodou legendary of Negro culture. Next to it, in familiarity, stood the animal worship of ancient Egypt. Finally, and most important, according to the surgeon's notes, was a completely alien culture which was as old as Earth, nay older, involving ancient elder gods and their terrible, unceasing conflict with equally primeval old ones, who bore such names as Cthulhu, Hastur, Yogg-Sothoth, shub Niggurath, and Nyarlathotep, and who were served in turn by such curious beings as the Cho-Cho people, the Deep Ones, the Shantaks, the Abominable Snowmen, and others, some of whom appeared to have been a suborder of human being, but others of which were either definite mutations or not human at all. All this fruit of Dr. Charrier's research was fascinating, but in no case had he adduced a definite, provable link. There were certain Saurian references in the Vodou cult, there were similar connections to the religious culture of ancient Egypt, and there were many obscure and tantalizing suggestions connecting the Saurians to the Cthulhu myth pattern, ranging far deeper into the past than Crocodilus and Gavialis, embracing Tyrannosaurus and Brontosaurus, Megalosaurus, and other Mesozoic reptilia. In addition to these interesting notes, there were diagrams of what seemed to be very odd operations, the nature of which I did not fully comprehend at that time. These were apparently copied out of ancient texts, particularly one given frequently as source entitled De Vermis Mysterious by Ludwig Prynne, another of those obscure references completely foreign to me. The operations themselves suggested a raison d'etre too astounding to accept on face. One of them, for instance, was designed to stretch the skin, consisting of many incisions made to permit growth. Yet another was a simple cross incision made at the base of the spine for the purpose of extension of the tailbone. What these fantastic diagrams suggested was too horrible to contemplate, yet it was part and parcel surely of the strange research conducted for so many years by Dr. Charrier, whose seclusion was thus readily explicable since his was a project which could only be conducted in secret lest it bring down upon him the scorn and laughter of his fellow scientists. Among these papers there were also certain references set down in such a manner that I could not doubt they were the experiences of the narrator. Yet for all that these antedated 1850, in some cases by decades, they were unmistakably in Dr. Charrier's handwriting, so that, excepting always the possibility that he had transcribed the experiences of someone else, it was evident that he was more than an octogenarian at the time of his death. Indeed, far more, so much more, that the very anticipation of it made me uneasy, and cast my thoughts back to that other Dr. Charrier who had gone before him. The sum total of Dr. Charrier's credo amounted to a strongly hypothetical conviction that a human being could, by means of certain operations, together with other unusual practices of a macabre nature, take upon himself something of the longevity that characterized the Saria, that as much as a century and a half, perhaps even two centuries, could be added to a man's lifespan, and beyond that, given a period of semi-conscious torpor in some moist place, which would amount to a kind of gestation, the individual could emerge again, somewhat altered in aspect true, to begin another lengthy span of life, which would, by virtue of the physiological changes which had taken place in him, be of necessity somewhat altered from his previous mode of existence. To support this conviction, Dr. Charrier had amassed only a number of legendary tales, certain data of a kindred nature, and highly speculative accounts of curious human mutations known to have existed in the past 291 years, a figure which later assumed far more meaning. When I realized that this was the exact span of time from the year of the birth of that earlier Dr. Charrier to the date of the later surgeon's death, nowhere in all this material was there anything resembling a concrete line of scientific research, with adducible proof-only hints, vague intimations, hideous suggestions, sufficient in truth to fill a casual reader with horrible doubts and terrible half-formed convictions, but not nearly enough to warrant the sober interest of any genuine scholar. How much farther I would have gone into Dr. Charrier's research, I do not know. Had it not been for the occurrence of that which sent me screaming in horror from that house on Benefit Street, it was possible that I would have gone much farther instead of leaving house and contents to be claimed by a survivor who I know now will never come, thus leaving the house to fall to its ultimate destruction 
by the city. It was while I was contemplating these findings of Dr. Charrier that I became aware of being under scrutiny, that manifestation people are fond of calling the sixth sense. Unwilling to turn, I did the next best thing. I opened my pocket watch, set it up before me, and used the inside of the highly polished case as a kind of mirror to reflect the windows behind me. And there I saw, dimly reflected, a horrible travesty of a human face which so startled me that I turned to view for myself that which I had seen mirrored. But there was nothing at the pane save the shadow of movement. I rose, put out the light, and hastened to the window. Did I then see a tall, curiously bent figure crouched and shuffling in an awkward gait into the darkness of the garden? I believed that I did, but I was not given to folly enough to venture out in pursuit. Whoever it was would come again, even as he had come the previous night. Accordingly, I settled back to watch, a score of possible explanations crowding upon my mind. As the source of my nocturnal visitor, I confess I put at the head of the list the neighbors who had long opposed the continued standing of the house of Dr. Charrier. It was possible that they meant to frighten me away, unaware of the shortness of my lease. It was also possible that there was something in the study they wanted, though this was far-fetched, in view of the time they had had to search the house during its long period of unoccupancy. Certainly the truth of the matter never once occurred to me. I am not by nature any more skeptical than an antiquarian might be expected to be. But the true identity of my visitor did not, I confess, suggest itself to me despite all the curious interlocking circumstances which might have conveyed a greater meaning to a less scientific mind than my own. As I sat there in the dark, I was more than ever impressed with the aura of the old house. The very darkness seemed alive but incredibly remote from the life of Providence which swirled all around it. The interior darkness was filled instead with the psychic residue of years, the persistent smell of moisture accompanied by that musk so commonly associated with reptilian quarters at the zoo. The smell of old wood, old limestone, of which the cellar walls were composed, the odor of decay for the centuries had begun to deteriorate both wood and stone. And there was something more, the vaporous hint of an animal presence, which seemed indeed to grow stronger with every passing moment. I sat there well over an hour before I heard any untoward sound. Then it was indistinguishable. At first I thought it a bark, akin to that sound made by alligators. But then I thought it rather less a figment of my perfervid imagination than the actual sound of a door closing. Yet it was some time before another sound smote upon my ears, a rustling of papers. Astonishing as it was, an intruder had actually found his way into the study before my very eyes without being seen. I turned on the flashlight which was directed at the desk I had left. What I saw was incredible, horrible. It was not a man who stood there, but a travesty of a man. I know that for one cataclysmic moment I thought consciousness would leave me. But a sense of urgency coupled with an awareness of acute danger swept over me, and without a moment's hesitation I fired four times at such range that I knew each shot had found harbor in the body of the bestial thing that leaned over Dr. Charrier's desk in that darkened study. Of what followed I have, mercifully, only the vaguest memory. A wild thrashing about the escape of the invader, my own uncertain pursuit. I had struck him certainly, for a trail of blood led from the study to the windows through which he had gone, tearing away glass and frame in one. Outside, the light of my flash gleamed on the drops of blood, so that I had no difficulty following them. Even without this to follow, the strong musk pervading the night air would have enabled me to trace whoever had gone ahead. I was led not away from the house, but deeper into the garden, straight to the curb of the well behind the house, and over the curb into the well, where I saw for the first time in the glow of the flashlight the cunningly fashioned steps which led down into that dark maw. So great was the discharge of blood at the well curb that I was confident I had mortally wounded the intruder. It was that confidence which impelled me to follow despite the manifest danger. Would that I had turned at the well curb and gone away from that accursed place? For I followed down the rungs of the ladder set into the well wall, not to the water below, as I had first thought I might be led, but to an aperture opening into a tunnel in the well wall, leading even deeper into the garden. Compelled now by a burning desire to know the nature of my victim, I pushed into this tunnel, 
unmindful of the damp earth which stained my clothes with my light thrust before me and my weapon in instant readiness. Up ahead I could see a kind of hollowed-out cavern, not any larger than enough to permit a man to kneel upright, and in the center of my flashlight's glow stood a casket, at sight of which I hesitated momentarily, for I recognized the direction of the tunnel away from the well led toward the grave of Dr. Charrier. But I had come too far to retreat. The smell in this narrow opening was almost indescribable. Pervading every part of the tunnel was the nauseatingly strong musk of reptiles. Indeed, it lay so thickly in the air that I had to force myself to press on toward the casket. I came up to it and saw that it lay uncovered. The trail of blood led to the edge of the casket and into it. Impelled by burning curiosity and a half-formed fear of what I might find, I rose to my knees and forced the light tremblingly into the casket. It may well be charged that after so many years my memory is no longer to be relied upon. But what I saw there was imprinted indelibly on my memory. For there, in the glow of my light, lay a newly dead being, the implications of whose existence overwhelmed me with horror. This was the thing I had killed. Half man, half saurian, it was a ghastly travesty upon what had once been a human being. Its clothes were split and torn by the horrible mutations of the flesh, by the crusted skin which had burst its bonds, its hands and unshod feet were flat, powerful in appearance, claw-like. I gazed in speechless terror at the shuddersome tail-like appendage which pushed bluntly out from the base of the spine at the terribly elongated crocodilian jaw, to which still grew a tuft of hair like a goat's beard. All this I saw before a merciful unconsciousness overcame me for I had seen enough to recognize what lay in that coffin him who had lain there in a cataleptic torpor since 1927, waiting his turn to come back in frightfully altered form to live again. Dr. Jean-Francois Charrier, surgeon born in Bayonne in 1636, died in Providence in 1927, and I knew that the survivor of whom he had written in his will was none other than himself, born again, renewed by a hellish knowledge of long-forgotten eldritch rites more ancient than mankind, as old as that early vernal earth on which great beasts fought and tore.